Intel has done it. Well, they did something. Intel Arc Alchemist is actually here, or it will be in 10 days from now. You know what? Screw it. Screw the clickbait. Let's just get into it. We'll talk gaming and creative applications in this video. A future video will cover smooth sync and extra stuff. A770, 329 bucks for eight gigabytes of VRAM or 349 for the 16 gigabyte of RAM limited edition, which is really just Intel's version of their founder's edition, a card they make in house. I asked during a press briefing how limited they're supposed to be and was told that it comes down mainly to demand, but they have no plans to EOL the cards and stop making them anytime in the short run. So why they're only charging $20 for double the VRAM is odd to me because that's an incredible value for the user, especially when other GPU manufacturers keep telling me VRAM is a significant cost on the card. Also, the limited edition has a slightly higher memory suite on the A77. A750, 289 bucks and has eight gigabytes of VRAM as well. In a way, this means that their lower end card will have some additional longevity. I'm not gonna say future proofing, but you know, longevity as far as memory requirements are concerned. But in my testing, the VRAM isn't necessarily all that useful on it due to the speed of the card. The limited edition cards are beautiful. Soft rounded corners, matte shells, diffuse lighting with USB controllable LEDs on the A770. They even have HDMI 2.1 apparently due to Intel implementing some sort of special display port conversion protocol on board, something they will spec out for board partners, but board partners may still use HDMI 2.0 here anyway. So look up reviews if that's a concern for you for 4K 120 or variable refresh rate on HDMI, those kinds of things. Intel poised these cards against Nvidia's RTX 3060, a card with an MSRP also at $329, though usually it cannot be found new under 400 bucks. I picked one up around $409 for this review, but I didn't have the means to also get an RTX 3060 Ti for comparison, but I am including the base RTX 2060, a card you can get used right now for about $315. So, does the A770 blow the RTX 3060 out of the water, or is this a chance for Nvidia to tell Intel to sit back down and learn a bit more? Well, neither, really. This is weird. There's honestly no clear winner here, other than the insane value of a used RTX 2080 at the moment. <laughs> Running Halo Infinite with the min and max frame rates set to 120 at 1440p, the RTX 2080 and 3060 both hold about 120 FPS on average. Meanwhile, the Intel A770 and A750 hold more around 100 FPS on average, weirdly enough. The game isn't super optimized still, but I wanted to make sure that I tested it because I love Halo. Another favorite of mine, Warframe, using the new enhanced graphics engine and DirectX 12 renderer at 1440p on high settings. The RTX 2080 dominates all of the cards, of course, but the RTX 3060 and A770 are neck and neck. These felt like near identical experiences when actually playing, though the A750 did lag behind a fair bit below the flock. In Splitgate, the A770 gives the RTX 3060 a fair lead for once, but as long as you're targeting 240 hertz or lower, all four cards will do you just fine. The RTX 3060, Intel A770 and A750 are all three nearly identical in Monster Hunter Rise at 1440p on high with all three running worse than the RTX 2080's worst frame rates by just a tiny bit. Pretty neat though. I was disappointed in the A770's performance in Apex Legends, however, another favorite of mine, where at 1440p on high, the RTX 3060 nudges it out for another win for Team Green, and the A750 struggles to really keep up at all here. On low settings at 1440p, the RTX 3060 approaches holding 144 Hz just outright. Meanwhile, the A770 really doesn't improve all that much. Let's bump it down to 1080p in medium settings, just as a nice little balance there. Honestly, the A770's performance still didn't change that much, though the A750 improved a little bit. Meanwhile, the RTX 3060 and 2080 both basically held 144 hertz pretty stable. Clearly, Intel's cards perform better on newer titles than older ones, as Intel's own data in their marketing actually you know, showed in the first place. This is reflected in my Spider-Man remastered test, 1440p high settings with ray tracing on high, actually, where the A770 actually slightly nudged out even the RTX 2080, and the A750 wasn't even that far behind the RTX 3060. I was actually very impressed here. This was a lot of fun. Uh, the, the performance was great until we turn on upscaling, which we'll talk about in a moment. In Ghostwire Tokyo, another DirectX 12 title with ray tracing off, the A770 performed neck and neck with the RTX 2080, and the A750 even beat out the RTX 3060. Wow. With ray tracing on high, performance normalizes a little bit as it hits hard in this game. 
Reflections are everywhere. A770 still nudges out the RTX 3060 a bit, but the A750 really falls short, and the RTX 2080's lead really grows here. Dropping RT too low, however, catches the A770 back up near the RTX 2080, and the 3060 not too far behind that, but the A750 is still kind of dragging far behind. I'd kind of say this isn't really a ray tracing GPU based on this one game test, which isn't worth much, I guess. All of this test so far have been at native resolution, but with the launch of their dedicated graphics cards, Intel also released their own AI upscaling technology, XESS. I'll leave it to our friends over at Digital Foundry to get you fully caught up on how it compares visually, but performance-wise, Ghostwire Tokyo gives us our first look on how it stacks up compared to AMD's FSR 2.0, Nvidia's DLSS, and TSR upscaling. All of these tests were still at 1440p high with ray tracing on high. XESS on the A770 outperformed every other upscaling methodology, with FSR 2.0 being a close second, and absolutely destroys the RTX 3060 running DLSS, XESS, FSR, and TSR. All of them. This is real fast. Holy cow. If Intel can really lock this down with a bunch of DirectX 12 titles, it's going to really give NVIDIA and AMD a run for their money on newer games. Seriously, spend that Intel money. <laughs> Spider-Man, on the other hand, doesn't have XESS implemented yet, but it does have DLSS, FSR 2.0, and Insomniac's own temporal inter interpolation tech uh, that they built for their own games here. With upscaling enabled and ray tracing still on high, the 3060 from NVIDIA still beats out the A770 across all upscaling modes. So it kind of leapfrogs it, whereas the A770 was beating it at native res. Weird, but the native res performance is still progress. All in all, the driver experience, a big point of drama around these cards has been mostly fine for me. I've had a few instances where when I'm DDUing and swapping cards back and forth and reinstalling the drivers where the Intel driver installation would just fail or even hang, but I've had that with other GPUs in the past as well. I did have a single full system hang when actually using the cards, and that was with Topaz Gigapixel on the A750, and that never happened again. Using our control, gaming, all of it has been fairly smooth sailing. But I also didn't really have any major issues with the drivers for my A380 for the past couple months on either my test bench or my main PC when it was sideloaded with another graphics card either. Maybe I'm in the minority. For a quick synthetic benchmark, 3D Mark's Time Spy DirectX 12 benchmark has both the A750 and A770 wiping the floor with both the RTX 3060 and 2080, wildly enough, at 1440p Ultra. All right then. 3D Mark also has an XESS performance test to show the performance gains of a Intel's AI upscaling algorithm. For both the A750 and A770, you gain about 50% performance using XESS. But XESS running on NVIDIA is only around 33 to 35% gains. Of course, NVIDIA could improve this with some sort of driver update to support the implementation better, but that's where we're at right now. Gaming is cool and all, but what about creative work? Are these secret creative powerhouses? Here, it's honestly just as mixed as gaming. Using Puget Bench by the wonderful Puget Systems, they build workstations for, you know, creator and industry folk. They built their own benchmark suite for a lot of apps. In DaVinci Resolve, the RTX 3060 still beats out the A770 in most of the testing scores, but playback and effects in both Premiere and Resolve had the A770 performing a little better, and same thing with 4K media playback and Resolve. But the NVIDIA cards were kind of faded to win, as CUDA is just so powerful in video editing. It's kind of why most video editors always flock to NVIDIA, because CUDA is just... Exporting a basic Resolve project with a variety of source codecs, some stabilization, some color grading, GPU accelerated transitions. Intel's H.265 beats out the 3060 and 2080. So does their AV1 encodes too, which NVIDIA can't do on release GPUs yet. This is in part thanks to hyper encode capabilities, where your system can use both the dedicated GPU and the Intel iGPU to export H.265 across both parts. But Intel loses an H.264 export time where it doesn't have that as NVIDIA's H.264 encoders are just so damn fast. In Adobe Photoshop, the RTX 3060 beats Intel's offering in the overall score and in filter processing, but the A770 actually wins on GPU score and the general processing score, beating out even the RTX 2080 in these categories. So if you don't do a lot of video, these cards are looking a lot better for creative work. The seriously impressive photo editing performance continues into other apps. In Lightroom Classic, the A770 doesn't win every score, but in many of the actual individual tasks, like building smart previews, merging panoramas and HDR composites, and converting images to DNG, the A770 just dominates. 
I wanted to include my Affinity Photo benchmarks here too, but it just purely wouldn't launch on the Intel GPUs. I think they need to update it for compatibility first or something. What about AI? Both the A750 and A770 absolutely blow the RTX cards out of the water, with 42% faster upscaling from 720p to 4K in Topaz Labs Video Enhanced AI, Intel all the way for that kind of upscaling. However, upscaling in Topaz Gigapixel was not a win for Intel, with the NVIDIA RTX 3060 and 2080 beating Intel's cards a decent bit. Topaz's new AI upscaling app, however, Photo AI, is a complete wash for NVIDIA, with Intel's cards taking only about half as long as NVIDIA's to upscale some images with some automatic face detection, sharpening, and raw conversion, things like that, with NVIDIA's cards weirdly performing almost as slow as just straight CPU processing or the iGPU on the 12900K. I ran this multiple times across multiple reinstalls, even after doing additional tests. Results kept coming out the same. Wild. I also wanted to test Handbrake to show export times for 4K video in H.264, H.265, and AV1 on the Intel cards on the slowest quality presets. This turned out to not be an apples to apples comparison, as NVENC has many more quality settings than QuickSync. And on both the slowest and the slow setting, which is actually skipping a tier, NVENC was still slower than QuickSync. But this isn't a full representation of NVENC's maximum encoding capability, as NVENC is still really, really fast, as we saw in some of our other video tests. Of course, I can't cover all of this without reminding you that these GPUs do come with hardware AV1 video encoding and decoding. AV1 is a new open source video codec with insane quality at low bit rates that is 100% the future of streaming. I have covered both this and the H.264 and H.265 quality on these GPUs in a full dedicated video here, but needless to say, it's incredible. That being said, don't buy one of these two, the A770 or A750, for a dedicated encoding card. The A380, for much cheaper, is all you need for that. Arc Control, Intel's software suite for the GPUs, akin to NVIDIA's GeForce Experience, is an awesome start, but it does need some work. Driver management is not really present, instead being offloaded to the separate Intel driver and support assistant. It has some basic recording and highlights capabilities, which is pretty cool, but it's very limited. It's not great at the moment. You can choose to record in H.264 or HEVC, but you're very limited on bit rates, and you cannot record 60 FPS at any resolution higher than 1080p for some reason. Don't really understand why. Plus, it doesn't auto name files based on game name like most other apps like this, instead expecting you to manually name files each time you hit record, which is not cool when you're trying to quickly get game clips or whatever. Highlights are supported, but it's completely unclear as to what games are actually supported for highlights, what qualifies as a highlight, you know, how it detects them and so on. So I turned it on in a couple games and never got anything. Performance penalty wise, we're looking at a 20 FPS drop on 1440p high on the A770 running Apex Legends and similar results on the A750, slightly worse. This matches the NVIDIA GeForce Experience Shadow Play recording on the RTX 2080, but on the 30 series, 30 series and newer NVENC is so much faster that you have basic, it's a significantly lower performance impact. So it is more performance impact than the 3060, but about on par with the 2080, so keep that in mind. And of course, I encountered the random bug where it would continuously capture my second monitor instead of my game for some reason. This was a problem for Shadowplay 2, of course, but it is just infuriating. Hook game and capture the game. Give me an option to toggle it to only record the game hook. I don't know. Like I said, it's a fantastic start, and I look forward to it getting updates. Oh yeah, there's also some performance tuning you can try out, similar to what NVIDIA added to GeForce Experience. I'm not going to mess with it for the purposes of this video. This has been a wild and rough past week or so. My kid's been sick and I didn't get to benchmark anywhere near as I wanted to, but these GPUs are a wild ride and I'm incredibly stoked for Intel to keep this train rolling to see if they can get their DirectX 11 performance up from what it is and maybe keep going toe-to-toe -to -toe on DirectX 12. If you're going toe to toe with your desk aesthetic, uh, pick up one of my blank VHS desk mats at eposfox.gg slash merch. You're really missing out on crucial encoding information though, so make sure you watch this video, click over here to watch this video about Intel's hardware AV1 encoders and how the H.264 and H.265 stacks up against AMD and Nvidia, and remember to be kind, rewind.